Hi everyone, thanks very much for joining me. So in this video, six short reviews, six different kinds of films, hopefully something of interest for you. Um, so first up from 2020, we have the film Sweet Thing. This is directed by Alexander Rockwell. Alexander Rockwell's an independent filmmaker who's been working for a few decades now. Possibly you may know the film from 1995, uh, Four Rooms, which had Quentin Tarantino involved, as well as Robert Rodriguez and Alison Anders, each of the directors did a segment for this film. Um, but yeah, Sweet Thing is really uh, quite a special film, I think, from Alexander Rockwell, and a very personal one as well. He has uh, his children, Lana Rockwell and Nico Rockwell, involved in this, as well as his wife, Karen Parsons. Um, and they're all excellent, really, really good performances here. Um, but yeah, basically, this is a coming-of-age type drama. We've got the two children, um, and the parents are separated. Um, the children are trying to live with their father, but he's very lovable, but he's also a highly problematic alcoholic. Um, and it's a fantastic performance from the great Will Patton in that role. Um, and then meanwhile, the mother, uh, played by Karen Parsons, uh, she's in a new relationship, but with a man who is also a drinker and who's also abusive both uh, physically and sexually so not an easy time of it for the kids and uh, so when they can't stay with the father and they can't stay with the mother they hit the road with another child uh, who also has problematic parents um, so yeah and then this is just a beautiful kind of film where we're following these young kids on the railway tracks um, in a boat uh, in a mansion house that they're able to break into um, as well as uh, a caravan where they find a, a friendly couple who are willing to feed them um, yeah quite a beautiful film this um, you know obviously it does have some disturbing elements to it with the alcoholism and the abuse um, but uh, it's the performances that really make this a touching film um, Sweet Thing is the uh, song that was performed by Van Morrison a beautiful song um, and in this film Lana Rockwell does a rendition of it as well uh, really nicely done um, but yeah just watch this film for the performances for that excellent cinematography it's all filmed on different kinds of film stock mostly in black and white but with some color segments um, and yeah it's a really strong film from Rockwell it does have a bit of a rushed ending um, and possibly that betrays the film's low budget um, but yeah I really enjoyed this film uh, it's really striking visually and the performances are great Eric the Viking is from 1989 and it's directed by Terry Jones, one of the Monty Python crew who had also directed Life of Brian, Meaning of Life and Monty Python and the Holy Grail. Um, but significantly, Terry Jones here is without the rest of the Monty Python crew, with the exception of John Cleese, who's also in the cast. And uh, yeah, this is nowhere near as funny as a typical Monty Python film. The script in this one is quite cringeworthy at times. Um, Tim Robbins in this plays Eric the Viking, who's, uh, he can do the looting and pillaging and killing side of things. He's not so hot on the raping kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, in this film, he gets together with a group of uh, men to head off towards Valhalla and bring around the end of the Age of Ragnarok. Um, as with some of the other films that Terry Jones has directed, this has got some good production design and costumes in terms of the Viking era um, but that's about as far as things go really I mean like I say the, the humor in this is not particularly funny it's okay I mean there are some laughs to be had but a lot of the script is a bit flat um, and there are some dull stretches now funnily enough I actually saw this back in 1989 at a, a royal charity premiere in uh, Brighton when they had the Brighton Film Festival it was a, a three-day event in which I saw 15 films over three days. I loved it. Uh, but yeah, here's my actual um, ticket and the program from the time. Um, and here you can get to see some of the cast. There's John Cleese there. Um, and there's the rest of the cast. I've got John Gordon Sinclair uh, here, who was in Gregory's Girl. Um, and here's this Viking ship. Now, the funny thing about this, uh, seeing this in Brighton, was that to promote the film, they did actually have the Viking ship uh, on just off the seafront. And they also had a whole load of extras 
uh, in Viking costumes on the beach. And I'll just show you a series of photos now, um, which I took at the time. So this was uh, a bit of an event. They had Miss Brighton on the beach. And um, uh, yeah, poor girl, I'm not quite sure if she really knew what she let herself in for because uh, all these um, Viking guys had a mock battle on the beach, which ended up with them actually carrying off Miss Brighton on their shoulders as if they were going to take her off to the boat. Um, but yeah, that mock battle on the beach was probably more entertaining than the film itself. Um, so yeah, I have quite some good memories of that. But yeah, Terry Jones was there along with John Gordon Sinclair and um, Charles McEwen and Tim McKinney and uh, Gary Cady, all cast members. Um, so yeah, that was fun to see that. Uh, but yeah, like I say, the film itself is not too great nowadays. The comedy is very dated. Um, not a huge amount of laughs. Eight Hours of Terror is a film from 1957 directed by Seijun Suzuki. Um, this is one of his early films. The director is perhaps best known to Criterion lovers in particular for films such as Branded to Kill and Tokyo Drifter. Uh, but yeah, basically in this film, it's a chance for Suzuki just to try and find his feet with a low budget. Um, the film involves uh, various people from different classes and backgrounds who are stranded at a train station and need to get their connection to Tokyo. Um, so they all agree to go on a small bus on a perilous mountain journey, uh, but also as well as the dangers of the mountain road itself, there are bank robbers armed who are on the loose. Um, so yeah, this is quite a fun film. Um, it does have very exaggerated characters, but that's really just to make the point about post-war Japan and the different kind of class structures that are there. Um, but then also Suzuki is working with very confined spaces. So we've got the interior of the bus, uh, which houses all the different characters, um, some external shots, um, and then the uh, sort of dramatic elements as well with the bank robbers. So yeah, it's quite a playful film, a brisk pace. Um, not his best film by any means, but uh, an interesting uh, early film in his career. A Summer Story is from 1985, and it's directed by Piers Haggard. Uh, Piers Haggard, possibly better known for some of his TV work uh, than he is for films. He directed the TV adaptation of Dennis Potter's Pennies from Heaven that starred Bob Hoskins, as well as directing the 1979 TV version of Quatermass that starred John Mills. Um, a Summer Story is a kind of genteel romance and quite an antiquated one at that, set in 1904 uh, in Dartmoor, uh, but actually filmed in places such as Sidmouth and Dartmouth. Um, and Exmoor. Um, but uh, yeah, this one involves James Wilby, who's an aristocratic type who comes down from Chelsea in London to the countryside for a walk with his lawyer friend. And during this walk, he badly twists his ankle and then needs to seek refuge in a nearby farmhouse. Susanna York is the uh, woman who owns the farmhouse. Um, and she has an orphan girl there who's played by Imogen Stubbs. Um, who works on the farm and when James Wilby and Imogen Stubbs set eyes on each other, romance begins. Um, but yeah, there's problems afoot because Susanna York's son, played by Jerome Flynn, um, also has his eyes set on uh, Imogen Stubbs and uh, James Wilby also is under peer pressure to return to London and surely uh, a girl such as Imogen Stubbs, who's such a country girl, just won't survive in London. So we get a bit of class battle here um, and uh, it doesn't end very well for everybody. Um, yeah, this is uh, not the greatest story in terms of character depth. Um, it's quite superficial, really. Um, but uh, what is enjoyable is the gorgeous uh, George Delarue score um, and just all the countryside settings. I mean, it really is filmed in some beautiful English countryside. Uh, so that makes it all worthwhile. The 1981 film Looker is written and directed by Michael Crichton. Crichton, perhaps best known to some for writing Jurassic Park, uh, but he also previously written and directed Westworld and Coma. Uh, Looker is a very silly film uh, and it does have very thin characterizations, but wow, I found this really entertaining. Uh, it's great fun. Uh, Albert Finney in this is a plastic surgeon uh, in LA uh, who works on models who are keen to get into TV commercials. Um, but then he finds that some of these models are dying 
Um, as it turns out, we've got James Coburn here uh, running a secret research facility where he's developed a method of, if you like, CGI, where they can recreate the model's looks on computer uh, and have that CGI model performing in the commercial instead. Uh, and not only does that CGI model do the acting, uh, but also uh, on the screen, it's then able to hypnotize the viewer as well so that they will um, look to buy the product. Um, surely none of this could be true. <laughs> um, but yeah, so this is a very silly film. Uh, it's like I say, it's it's more of a an idea rather than a fully fleshed out film. Um, but it just is hugely entertaining. I had a great time watching it. I think it looks great. There's some really good camera work in here, um, and the score is good fun as well. It's kind of a bit like a Tangerine Dream like score. Uh, Suzanne Day also stars in this, uh, beautiful actress. Um, and uh, yeah, this is just a good fun. Just don't take it too seriously, just enjoy the ride. Food of the Gods is a film from 1976 and it's directed by Bert I. Gordon. Gordon is a director who has an affinity for making films about oversized creatures. Um, so yeah, if you like creature features uh, and you like silly ones, then this may be for you. Um, I had quite a good time with it. I mean, it has got very noticeable uh, effects, um, but that's part of the fun, I think. Um, but yeah, basically what we have here is people who are living on an island. They've discovered some kind of ooze that's uh, coming out of the rocks. Uh, at first, they think it might be oil that will make them wealthy, but it's not. It's some kind of different kind of gunk, if you like, um, and seems worthless, ultimately. Um, so it's fed to the chickens, um, but... The chickens then grow to huge mutant size, taller than humans, uh, and then also rats feed on it as well. And so before we know it, we've got Marjo Gortner as a hunter uh, who's come to the island and he realises that things are not quite as they should be uh, when one of his friends gets stung by a mutant sized wasp. Um, and so he manages to return to the island after taking his friend home uh, to try and find out what's going on. Um, and the person who owns the cabin where this ooze has developed is actually played by Ida Lupino, funnily enough. And this is one of her very last film roles. Uh, and she stars in this alongside Ralph Mika as well, and also one of his last film roles. Um, so yeah, this is a very bizarre film. Like I say, it is quite good fun just seeing all these different kind of uh, uh, creature effects. Um, so Burt Gordon uses actual footage of rats. Um, sometimes filmed close up to make them look much larger than they are, sometimes using models of cars or houses to make them look bigger, um, and then sometimes actually using um, sort of built practical effects type rats as well that are sort of bigger than pillows and gnash and gnaw at things. Um, so yeah, all very silly, a lot of split screen here and there. Some of it looks very bad but some of it is just quite good fun to watch um, so yeah not a great film by any means but uh, definitely a little bit of fun if you like creature feature films Ghost Watch from 1992 is a movie that's in a bit of an anomaly. Um, basically, this is a TV movie, but it gave the impression at the time of being a live broadcast and it scared millions of people. Um, basically, what we have here is the impression of a live broadcast where we have TV presenters, uh, Michael Parkinson, Sarah Green, Mike Smith, Craig Charles. These were all well-known TV presenters at the time. Um, and uh, they are there to see if they can capture uh, any goings on uh, in a house that is supposedly haunted and it's where a woman and her two children are staying. Uh, in the studio we've got Michael Parkinson together with a psychologist who has been following this family for some time and who has witnessed some of the events. Um, we've got Mike Smith, who's manning the phones. Uh, so people were actually calling in at the time with their stories of um, ghostly tales and uh, their imaginings of what they could see on the screen. They thought they could see a figure. Um, and then at the house itself, we've got Sarah Green with the woman and her two children. And she's there to sort of uh, be company with them and see if their camera crew can actually record 
and find anything that's going on in the house that night. So yeah, and it all gives the impression of being a bit chaotic in the studio. Sometimes we're cutting from the studio to the house, sometimes having to cut back from the house to the studio. Um, and there's, so every now and again, there's a little bit of uncertainty as to what we should be watching. Um, so that keeps it almost quite realistic, really, in terms of how TV was back then for live shows. Um, but uh, yeah, if you can get into this thing, then uh, you may well be scared by it too, because uh, certainly a lot of people were back in 1992, and the film actually, like I say, it caused quite a bit of a stir, and the BBC actually then refused to uh, rebroadcast it for um, quite some time and in fact I don't think they have shown it again uh, but I believe it's now uh, it has uh, since come out on DVD maybe a decade ago uh, but I think it's now coming out on Blu-ray as well but yeah this is a very significant show and it is before uh, such sort of live footage uh, things as the Blair Witch Project uh, we're well before that so yeah this was a, a big event for the BBC trying to sort of replicate the kind of thing that scared people uh, so much when Orson Welles did the War of the Worlds broadcast. Um, but yeah, perhaps they weren't quite prepared for what they got themselves into because, yeah, like I say, there was quite a bit of a stir around this one. Um, but yeah, I quite enjoyed watching this. I didn't see it at the time and I can't remember why. I do remember the Radio Times magazine uh, sort of advertising it, but uh, either I was busy or whatever, I didn't get to see it at the time. But, uh, um, but yeah, quite fun to catch up with it now. Like I say, you can, watching it now, obviously you can tell where some of the acting is and uh, um, all of that kind of stuff. But I can imagine if I had seen this originally, I probably would have been scared by it. Um, but uh, but yeah, see what you think. I mean, I think Ghost Watch is definitely worth a watch. It has got a, a classic status because it was such a, a big event for the BBC. Um, but uh, yeah, there we go. Okay, so there we go. That's just my roundup of six different films. Uh, let me know if any of these interest you. Let me know if you've seen any of these. Uh, please leave some comments. Please like, subscribe. Please do come back for some more videos. Uh, I look forward to seeing you. I hope you will keep me company. Okay, all right. Thanks very much. Bye-bye.